Welcome back into the film room. I'm your host, Eric Turner. I am joined by Nate Geary this week, and the Bills got a big win, Nate, at home. Probably one of their biggest wins in the last few years against, obviously, a really good opponent. We're, we're going to break down some Josh Allen, but give me your thoughts on the win. Yeah, the, the, the term marquee uh, comes to mind when I think about this, uh, this win's signature, right? Um, a real opportunity, uh, a measuring, uh, measuring stick type of game. Um, and, you know, for some of the games that we've seen over the last month, um, in particular, Kansas City and Tennessee, um, those were measuring stick games or opportunities to sort of, um, you know, tell everybody who this team really is. And they, they kind of failed those tests. So, um, you know, it, it was really good to see this Bill's defense come around. Um, play the level of football that I think they know um, they're capable of playing, but more importantly, um, sort of what the fan base's expectation is of that defense, of what they've been historically under Sean McDermott and Leslie Frazier. So it was really nice to see that. And obviously it was the Josh Allen show. And, um, you know, it's funny. I think I texted you on Sunday after the game. I basically said, is this another example of what we'll be able to say is this is Josh Allen's best career game, which will be like the fourth time we've said it already um, this season. And, um, you know, I, I hope that throughout the the next you know hour or so here, when we um, when we get through this breakdown, I echo some of the um, the frustrations of the fan base. They're they're still sort of waiting for people in the national media to to get on board here. And um, this week, there's talk about well, the Dolphins are the team to beat in the AFC East, as if what the Bills have done is just completely negated because Tua Tunga Viola has played two games. So um, listen, though, I mean, if you're a fan and you're looking for the satisfaction of hearing the Nick Wrights and the, um, you know, Kian Faye's of the world to finally admit um, that, that Josh Allen's a, is a good football player, I, I think you're going to be waiting a while. So um, that's why it's, it's your and my job to uh, to really break this down, uh, look look under the hood and give you a, a thorough analysis of, um, just how good or poorly he's played in a given week. And and I can tell you this week, we've got a doozy to, uh, to, to unfold for you. Yeah. As you can see per pro football focus, Josh Allen, as you mentioned, he went for over 400 yards again, three touchdowns through the air. And the two things that I want to talk about uh, against the Seahawks were the pressure and how Josh Allen handled that pressure. You can see when he was under pressure versus no pressure, when he was blitzed, when he was not blitzed and the Seahawks blitzed him on 28 dropbacks out of his 48. So that's right around what 58% or so. And he completed 19 passes out of 24 attempts, uh, 79% completion percentage, 259 yards, two touchdowns. He was sacked three times, sacked seven times on the day, but I don't think that was really reminiscent or reflective of how well the offensive line actually held up versus a lot of these pressures. So I want to get your thoughts about Josh Allen and how he's handled the, handled the pressure in this game and this year, because it's something he struggled with in 2019. Yeah, man. I mean, you just look at those, the yardage outputs. I mean, those are good games just individually versus not being blitzed and when blitzed or under pressure or no pressure. It's pretty remarkable. And it was remarkable to watch during the, and sort of as the game played out, the, the different ways that, that Seattle attempted to try to just slow down, bog down the offense. Um, and they couldn't do it. I mean, they threw man coverage out there. Not sure why. Um, I think probably the, the, the part of the game that I enjoyed the most watching um, was, was the kind of the beginning, the, the middle portion of the third quarter heading into the fourth quarter, where it was essentially Jamal Adams walking up to the line of scrimmage and blitzing three out of four downs. Like right. that is what he was. That's it. That was his sole job at times, because frankly, he was getting absolutely torched by Stefan Diggs and the bills receivers when he was attempting to play coverage from the box. So, um, you know, I, I loved the, the sort of one-on-one -on -one feel it felt like at times we were seeing between Jamal Adams and Josh Allen. I thought it was really entertaining. Um, and, and then ultimately when the, when the game came down to it, which, you know, it becomes a seven point game in the third quarter. Um, you're wondering, uh, you know, is this reminiscent of the, um, of the Los Angeles Rams game? Are the bills going to give up this lead that they've held the entire game? Um, but I thought the turning point came, um, the bills got gifted a penalty from Jamal Adams in a legal, uh, legal contact with, uh, with Cole Beasley. Beasley. Yep. and I think in years past, you know, maybe that's not a situation the bills take advantage of. Um, and I thought they did a tremendous job getting to the red zone and then scoring a touchdown in seven points. We talked about it in the lead up to this game, how important it would be to score touchdowns and not settle for field goals when you were given the opportunity. And I right. thought the bills did a fantastic job when they got in the red zone. I thought, um, Josh Allen's, uh, just, just raw accuracy numbers. 
um, are through the roof in this game, considering the attempts. Um, 31 <clears throat> completions on 38 attempts is, um, I mean, that's a fantastic it's a day. It's a good day. It's, it's a, a good, good day. day. <laughs> and, 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 you know, listen, and, and I think Mina Kimes um, said this on NFL Countdown uh, yesterday on ESPN in the lead up to Monday Night Football and said, um, or maybe it was PTI. It was one of those things, right? It was one of the ESPN shows. Yep. And basically it was, um, uh, I'm sorry, it was L. Duncan. Anyways, it was L. Duncan on uh, on uh, PTI and um, or around the horn, whatever. You know what I'm saying. Yep. Um, she kind of mentioned, uh, as all three of the other guys were talking about this game in terms of Seattle, um, what, what it was that Seattle wasn't doing. She really wanted to go on record as saying, it was, I don't care what the team that lost did. Like, yeah. let's, let's give credence. Let's talk about what this the team that won did the bills and the offense. Um, because let me tell you, not very many coaches I think are comfortable enough in their own scheme to just go out and run, uh, run the ball three times on designed runs in the first half and throw the ball 28 times. Um, they knew the weakness, they exploited the weakness and they kept pressing their fingers on the wound. Um, and it was probably one of the, um, I think maybe best examples um, of just out coaching the opponent. Um, that Brian Dable has put on display yet. It was a really impressive game from Josh Allen, but I would make the argument that this was Brian Dable's best game uh, as a Bills offensive coordinator in terms of play calling. Yeah, I think it was interesting from the perspective of the coaching staff, McDermott, Brian Dable, as you mentioned, how last week it was getting over that hump, getting the monkey, you know, monkey off their back and beating Belichick and the Patriots. Then this week was like, okay, now they got to beat a really good team. Yeah, I, I mean, they beat the Rams. I think that's a marquee game for them as well this year. I know it was earlier in the year, but I think that was a big game as well. But this one was like, okay, this is an opponent that we're going to have to try to outscore. And they went toe-to-toe with these guys, and, and you know, they obviously beat them. Um, I thought the game plan, uh, the way it unfolded in that first half and, and how the Seahawks were trying to pressure Josh Allen and force, and, you know, force him to make turnovers, and he was just in total control of the offense and uh, you know, total control of the checks, and he was just slinging it all over the field. Uh, obviously, those numbers you know, hold up and show that in that first half. And I thought, as you mentioned, Brian Dable's script, while it was aided by some turnovers and short fields, well, guess what? Some of those things weren't going to get in their direction earlier in the year. This time they got it and they capitalized on it. So that I think was huge. And then again, grand scheme is beating a team like this in this manner. If they have to go and air it out, they can do that. Last week, they had to run it a lot. They could do that. So they're they're starting to execute these game champion. plans. Yeah, they're building, building blocks, right? So if 100%. we need to do this, we need to do that. We can get it done. So I want to take a look, you know, kind of scale it back a little bit and take a look at some of, you know, the pressure numbers that Josh Allen has endured since, you know, coming into the league. We're going to start in 2019, though, um, and look at some of his numbers, how he handled pressure the last couple of years. And as you can see, per PFF, last year he was under pressure 36.1% of his dropbacks. He only had five touchdowns, four interceptions. And his adjusted completion percentage was 55.6. And that's not that good. That's way towards the bottom. As you can see, ranked 36 among QBs that have 20% of the dropbacks. Now, let's fast forward to this year and how he's handled pressure. Let's take a look at his completion percentage. And also, you know, some of those numbers uh, against pressure, eight touchdowns, four interceptions. It's 38% of his dropbacks, 38.6% of his dropbacks. But as you can see, his adjusted completion percentage is much higher and closer to what is probably right around average uh, in the league. So talk about Josh Allen's adjustment. But again, we have to give kudos to Brian Dable and his staff because they are giving him the answers to these pressures, to these zero looks, these zero blitz looks. I mean, Brian Dable, you, you talked about it just a second ago, man. So go ahead and run with it again, man. Yeah, uh, the number I want you to look at is the yards. I mean, he's yeah. at least he's, he's 150 more yards than the next person uh, under pressure. I, I mean, the thing that strikes me is, hey, is the efficiency always going to be there against uh, uh, under pressure? No. And I mean, it, it, it's impossible to be perfect. It's, it's, it's part of what makes the NFL so difficult right. um, is how defenses disguise those blitzes. But I think far more this year than last year and even the year before that, um, they just seem to have the answers when a team makes an adjustment into a certain look or into a certain scheme. Um, and if you want to run zero blitz at them, well, they've already determined that they're comfortable throwing those screen passes. And yeah. they're really hard to defend, and they set them up really well. And Josh knows when he gets to the line of scrimmage that he's got them in his back pocket. And now, as teams start to adjust to that, 
now what's the next chapter that 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 folds into those zero blitz looks um and 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 a lot of those zone blitz looks we talked yeah. a lot about um over the last couple of weeks how um teams were dropping bla- uh, dropping back and uh and, and bringing that slot corner um yep. and really forcing the bills to make adjustments there and they did as well so uh, really what it is to me is um the the changes uh, that that brian dable has been able to make real time during these games but the execution that josh allen's been able to do um or been able to maintain throughout the season you know i think those are big 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 jumps um up for for uh, for allen in terms of raw statistics yeah, and you saw the in-game adjustments as the Seahawks were pressuring in that second half, uh, late late first half, early second half. Uh, you saw them start to bust out some of those screens, and guess what? Even Pete Carroll said afterwards, he said, hey, we had to kind of back off of that because that's what, you know, those screens, when you're pressuring, if you throw a screen out there, that, the defense has to back off. And uh, we mentioned also at the top and how often the Seahawks played man coverage. So keep in mind, again, it's, you know, 38 attempts. Of those 38 attempts, they played man coverage on 17 of those attempts and Josh Allen had a God decent day. Him. Yeah. I mean, two touchdowns, uh, 182 yards uh, versus man coverage for Josh Allen. So if teams want to go back to that formula, you're going to see Josh Allen light it up because he has guys that can separate. And we saw Diggs put on a clinic last Sunday. Yeah. And not only that, Eric, I mean, you look at some of the separation numbers um, yeah. from that football game. I mean, the bills um, offense, led the league in catches with at least 10 or more yards of, of separation. I mean, that's kind of unheard of. Mm-hmm. Um, poor Quentin Dunbar. Uh, we're going to probably break down five or seven. Yeah. Plays, yeah. Uh, where poor Quentin Dunbar um, just gets absolutely taken to the woodshed. I, I there was times I literally, I felt bad um, <laughs> for Quentin Dunbar that the coaching staff just kept throwing him out there because he clearly wasn't totally healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that show during the game, he just got, I, I mean, Stefan Diggs. A lot of a lot of those defensive backs, there are several, there's a handful of defensive backs on that team that probably owe Stefan Diggs their lunch money after that game. Yeah, it was uh you're right. And we're gonna break down a few of those plays. So without further ado, Nate, let's go ahead and jump into the film. All right, Nate, first play, it is the very first play of the game, 1451 on the clock, first and ten situation. And I like Josh Allen's ability to diagnose his coverage and find his outlet. He works from top to bottom on the screen, left to right on the field. And he's basically trying to find the outlet versus a cover three defense. And this is cover three match. So to the top of the screen, the two wide receivers are running more vertical routes. So that becomes man coverage to the bottom though. It's more zone coverage. So you're going to see this flats defender right here, not catch the width that he should to the sideline here on the stop route by Singletary and Josh Allen eventually makes it to him and finds his outlet and Singletary is able to get positive yards on this play. So Nate, from the end zone angle also as well, you'll see him find the platform to th- throw from right here. A good job of manipul- manipulating that pocket. Uh, what are your thoughts on this play from Josh Allen? Obviously, you want to get him started, you know, right, get him started quickly. And this is a play that the Seahawks really made him work to get to his pretty much his last option on this. Yeah, and this is a good example of a full field read, right? right. And um, I, I think the, you see a good um, you see a good understanding of him getting left or right. Now, sure, I think if you look at the bottom of the screen, is that maybe Isaiah McKenzie at the top of your screen, or is that Diggs maybe? Um, yeah. Now, as he's starting left or right, um, that's not a play that's really opening up for him. When he starts, that's probably his number one read on the play. So he makes his way through the zone over to the right side. Um, and as you mentioned, finding a linebacker um, who's trying to basically play two men on the play right. and trying and basically trying to, I don't even know that he's in this situation in a good enough position to try to bait Josh. Um, but it's very clear who he should throw the ball to at this point um, in the sequence. So he does a nice job of delivering the throw. Um, and you mentioned something there that I think is really important, which is getting Josh Allen okay. off to these hot starts. I know you and I have talked about it geez, uh, several times, a handful of times, how important it is for Josh to get off to a quick hot start. Um, Obviously, the kick return for Andre Roberts gets the adrenaline up going a little bit for him when he walks out in the field. He completes his first pass, and as we know, that could be something that creates a a domino effect for him for the rest of the game. So I thought he did a nice job starting quick, finding uh, Devin Singletary and getting to the open field. Yeah, I like this too, because as you mentioned, you know, he's looking to the top of the screen to the left side of the field, and he realizes, oh, this is Rip Liz. This is cover three Rip Liz, becomes man coverage up there. So now to the field, it's the normal cover three rules, cover three zone. I'm going to find my cover three beater. He does that, works through Beasley, works the seam, then ends up throwing it to Singletary. And he gets, again, a good start on the very first play of the game. 
All right. This is the touchdown play by Isaiah McKenzie in the slot to the bottom of the screen. And the way that Josh Allen processes this coverage, it's just money in the bank. He knew exactly what they were going to be in. They got the look they wanted. He does a good job of using his eye discipline and working through his progressions here in the first quarter. Of course, the Bills are running like a little swing flat curl concept to the top. And then the third option is McKenzie, who's in the slot. So you see Josh initially look to the flats. You see the linebacker who's on the line of scrimmage bail out to the flats. He widens. So then Josh looks to the, the curl route by John Brown. Now, one of those defenders of the Seahawks should be getting deep to cover that deep third. But because Josh separates his hand from the ball as if he's starting that delivery, they both jump the curl route by John Brown. So all Josh Allen does is what, Nate, we always talk about this. He reloads and he finds McKenzie up over the top for the touchdown. Yeah, smooth and accurately thrown football. And, you know, the pump fake makes it here, um, but also his eyes make it. His eyes in focus on the bottom of the, or on the top of the screen um, uh, for this play, I think ends up ends up conflicting that corner. Because um, I do think, and I think you mentioned it, I do think that corner um, is responsible responsible for that deep right. um, that deep third of the field especially based on what the uh, opponent or the opposing corner is doing um, yep. he's bailing back to the 10 yard line um, you, you would think that that corner uh, understands his responsibility there but I think he's thinking um, that based on he's got numbers on his side um, I think the the play call does a great job um, of overloading one side because I think the Seahawks in this instance think they've got this thing pretty well covered um, to the short side of the field but Josh does a great job manipulating um, the defense with that pump fake and with his eyes delivers a beautiful throw. And, um, you know, I'm surprised we haven't seen more of these types of things from Isaiah McKenzie because he just gets lost sometimes yeah. um, in the secondary, especially when you've got to worry about such great route runners um, at the top of the depth chart. And obviously we know what Gabriel Davis is capable of doing. So, um, you know, this is a great play design, but it really starts and finishes. And I think Josh is starting to understand and learn more just how effective that pump fake is. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I, I genuinely think it comes natural. Like I, I don't think he's doing that I agree. Um, in order to manipulate. I just think that that is, he's, he's sort of, his brain's firing. He's thinking of a decision and he's able to sort of recoil, reset, find his platform, which he does great here, sets himself up to make an accurate throw um, and does it. And, and obviously what a great, fantastic start to the game here. You can't, you literally couldn't have scripted uh, any better yeah. of a start. What third play of the game. This was, yeah. I mean, this is textbook working through progressions, you know, getting uh, taking what the defense gives you. And it's a big play, obviously to start off the game. All right, Nate, let's take, you know, a little trip down memory lane back to week one when Josh Allen uses this reverse pivot in the end zone to run a little play action boot and he air mails it over the top of John Brown. This is a play that should have been a touchdown. This is a play where Josh Allen should have set his feet and hit John Brown for the touchdown here. And the reason I bring this up is because if you guys paid attention to the game last week, Against the Seahawks, they ran a very similar play. You're going to have Dawson Knox right in the front of the end zone running an under route, and then Tyler Croft coming up and over the top on the back line for the touchdown. And Josh Allen, he corrects his mistake that he made in week one. He works through his progression, sets his feet, and hits Croft for the touchdown on this play. So talk about... You know, Josh learning from this and how, you know, difficult it is to get those hips around or do you prefer rolling to your left and throwing like this, uh, you know, as a quarterback? Absolutely, you do. I mean, that, those were my favorite throws because you could create the most torque. You could create the most velocity with, with your football because um, you're really bringing those hips in um, and, and you're, you're forced to really, um, I would say, o- almost accentuate the rotation of your hips. Um, and what he does here is he does a great job waiting until the last minute to turn those hips because it really, it, it stretches the defenses or, or the defense in this way from sideline to sideline. So you sort of create the opening in the middle of the field by him continuing that fake, making it look like he's looking at Dawson Knox. But this is something that I know if you're Brian Dable, you love to see, because what this proves is you're a coachable player that you can learn from mistakes, you can correct your mistakes. And if you're Josh Allen, you don't make the same mistake twice. And I think that's a really big compliment to Josh from from a coachability perspective, because, um, you know, these are the types of things to be successful. Um, Josh Allen, you know, can't miss these types of throws. And I think he knows that. And I think these are throws. This is what you call a layup. Right. And right. And, and I think a really good op- uh, or a really good. Um, way to determine whether or not you know you feel like Josh is playing well and is in a rhythm is he typically won't miss these layups if he's in that rhythm it's when he's 
you know, kind of out of sync or his mechanics are slightly off or his mind's slightly off. These are the types of throws he tends to sail or, or to throw inaccurately, but he does such a great job of creating the passing lane, as you're showing here, um, that makes this an easy pitch and catch for a touchdown. So great job by Allen, but great job being coachable um, and not being a kind of person that, that makes the same mistake twice. Right. And just a quick footnote, you know, Tyler Croft has impressed me the last few weeks. Watch his release off the line of scrimmage. Watch the rip right there through the defensive lineman. Then he rips through again the linebacker, and now he's off to the races along the back line. And puts KJ I, right right in a, in a spin cycle. Yeah, I mean this is just great work along the back line, and then the catch because this is this is a rifle from Josh Allen. I mean this, that's a this, jugs machine. Yeah, this is this is a great catch by Croft, and obviously another big touchdown early in the game against the Seahawks. All right, we're at the end of the first quarter, first and ten situation. And the Bills are in their stack set, so they have the running back stacked right behind the H back uh, at behind the line of scrimmage. And Josh Allen runs some play action on this play, and I just love how he lets you know the routes develop, and he just hangs tight in the pocket and trusts his receivers. He wants to initially throw it off play action to Diggs on the bottom, but he sees that that corner has a good jump on it. So what does he do? He comes all the way back across the field, and he trusts that John Brown's going to separate. When he throws this, John Brown hasn't separated yet. There's very little separation, but he trusts that he's going to separate at the top of the route, and he hits him on a rope to the top sideline. So Nate, talk about this route concept, talk about play action and how it lets Josh Allen not only read the field, but let hit, let his, you know, big arm, you know, push the ball down the field, especially on first down. It's not easy against the, these types of looks when you've only got three receivers going yeah. out, um, especially against um, a team that, that had been running a lot of zone up to this point. Um, but this looks like um, it looks like a cover one. Look, am I wrong on that? No, it does. It looks like it looks like man coverage or at least turned into man coverage based on the routes. Yeah, and it looked like pre-snap Jamal Adams coming back into the box sort of tips you off if you're Josh Allen that A, um, he probably could have made this throw to the sideline and completed it, but if you look at Jamal Adams, Jamal Adams is right in this passing lane, ends up getting his hands up, jumping up in the air because of the pump fake that Josh Allen, once again, there's the pump fake yep. um, kind of coming into play. But the impressive part about this, Eric, I mean, this is – a 35 or is this a 35 or 30 yard throw um, thrown with anticipation yep. thrown from the middle of the field to the sideline um, as he's sort of maneuvering his way through the pocket. I mean, there is a lot to this throw, um, the accuracy, the timing of the throw. Um, but I, you just, there, there's so much to love about a play like this. This is a really impressive um, and a, I mean, this is kind of one of those highlights that you would put on a Josh Allen arm strength reel, right? Um, because it does take a level of zip and arm strength to get this play. Um, but more importantly, that's the timing aspect of it is the anticipation of this, because if Josh waits to see, for him to uncover, it's not available to him. Um, and this is just an understanding of I trust my wide receiver to get open, to separate at the top of the route make an accurate throw to the sideline, giving himself an opportunity to guard himself from the defender and get a first down. Like it's just, it's really good stuff. And it, it, it resembled um, a play that you and I, I know have broken down several yeah. times. And I know that Brian Dable and Josh Allen are basically completing, um, you know, one to two times a game, um, the out route to the top of the screen mm -hmm. um, to, to Stefan Diggs on this play. And that's where he's going, but he's able to sort of pull it down and get back to the backside. Um, and really just make a fantastic throw uh, and move the change on an important drive. Yeah, I love his poise here in the pocket. As you can see, after that play action fake, there are a lot of guys around him. There's a lot of traffic. As you mentioned, Jamal Adams is coming downhill after that run action. And Moss does a good job of, you know, just getting in front of him, picking him up. But it's a good job of hanging tight in the pocket. Again, finding that platform, look a little slide to his left there. And as Bobby Wagner closes, just in case, you know, he wants to escape the pocket, he just rifles it down the field to John Brown. And it really, you know, it, it, this was all day. The corners were dejected all day. And as Brian Baldinger pointed out, look at, look at the corner here. He's pissed that John Brown oh, yeah. was able to separate Trey there. flowers. And he's their best corner too. All yeah. right. Nate, second quarter it's second and six. And this is a, a play where Josh is under pressure from a five man pressure. Of the Seahawks, he extends a play. And I just love how he is on the run. He is able to, you know, get his hips around and complete this pass to Gabriel Davis uh, over the middle here. And I just want you to talk about, you know, whether a quarterback can develop these type of traits in from the pocket, you know, sensing pressure, manipulating the pocket and extending plays like this, because one thing that stood out to me 
uh, after, you know, after watching and listening to press conferences after this game was how Pete Carroll said, and it might've even been today, how, you know, if you don't know who Josh Allen is, um, you, you, you begin to feel him. And this is one of those plays that Josh Allen felt the pressure in the pocket, but these are the type of plays that Josh Allen brings. They bring a five man pressure and he's able to escape the pocket and make a play down the field to his r- rookie wide receiver. So talk about his presence in the pocket here and his ability to extend the play. Yeah, generally speaking, pocket presence awareness, like I would say pocket awareness is definitely something that you can gain. And I think is is probably clued right in with confidence. Um, Typically your pocket awareness, you're going to feel that you can make plays from within a pocket if you're confident in what's being called and what you're doing on a given play. But what I really really feel isn't developmental is the, the like acuity, the sense within a pocket to feel defenders before they get there without having to turn your back to them or or turn your head to try to find them with your eyes. He feels them. And that is not something that Josh did in college. Um, Not, not well anyways. And it's certainly not something we saw him do with regularity, his rookie season either. Um, So the fact that this has turned into like a, a nice developmental trait that is helping Josh succeed to me really speaks volumes to the level of work that he puts in in the offseason, because this is something that you just have to kind of have with you um, as a player, as an NFL quarterback. And if you don't have it in college, it's really difficult to have it in the pros. And for this play, what's impressive to me is his ability to extend the play to, to, to sort of function outside the scope of the offense. And, um, you know, I know Dan Orlovsky, I think, broke this play down in particular, talking about um, just the ability of Josh to field things around him. Um, maintain his posture to throw the football um, and deliver an accurate ball on a play that's a really important play um, for this team on second and five, um, considering the fact that you need to continue scoring points. And when you get past half, um, when you get past mid the midway, midway point of the field, you've got to put the ball in the end zone. And this play right here um, is a really, really impressive play from Allen, just from his awareness and his, and his ability to feel pressure um, and still make plays when, frankly, the defense has this covered up very well. Yeah, they do. And I like this pressure that they send at him. They send a little twist. And I want you guys to pay attention to, uh, obviously, Gabriel Davis's route. He does a great job of working inside, outside, and then across the field. And then becoming QB friendly once Josh does escape the pocket. But I, I do think Josh is a little hesitant here. I think he drops his eyes just a little bit, but he gets a little help from Dawkins here. As that guy is looping inside, Dawkins spins back around. He's able he to cover him up, and now he's in business. I think right there, he kind of packed for a, you know, a split second. He had nowhere to go, but again, you talked about it. He's able to find an escape route, and then watch Gabriel Davis. He's coming down the line, and then Josh gets his hips around, but watch Davis work back to the ball. Yep. This is becoming QB friendly. By the time he catches it, he went from the 15-yard line to the 20 yard line, worked back to his quarterback and the bills are in business with a really good play outside of structure. All right, Nate, the bills are in an empty set here. And this is a sack that Josh Allen takes on third and long. I think it's like third and 12. And it's one that he actually had the answer to. He knew that guy was blitzing off the edge. KJ, Wright, The linebacker, he had an answer. His hot route was John Brown in a slot right here on just a quick out route. He, uh, so he understands the, the plan that the defense is trying to blitz him and pressure him. And they want him to throw it quickly. And hopefully the defense can rally and make the tackle. He needs to take what the defense is giving him. But I understand his mind, you know, and what he wants to do here. It's third and long. He doesn't want to just throw it short. You know, obviously he believes in not just his arm, but he believes in his legs. And he believes he can break the tackle of KJ8. Problem is that unblocked defender isn't the only guy with eyes on him. He has a spy and Bobby Wagner on him. So while Josh should have, should have thrown this hot, he elects to try to break the tackle and there's just no way he's getting out of the pocket. So talk about the decision here. And, you know, do you agree? He had the answer. He probably just didn't want to take it. He wanted to be the playmaker, right? And I respect that. Yeah, this, and, and I don't put this under the category of hero ball. I put this no. under the category of a quarterback who, who in these types of situations know that knows that he can make plays that other quarterbacks don't bingo and you know and and in this instance i think this is one of those rare plays from this game where you just tip your cap to the seattle defense because they had a good play called they blitzed with a spy i mean that's not that's not a look you see a whole ton um if you're josh allen so if you're seeing kj Wright come off the edge your first thought and you actually see this space get created um i think josh thinks he might have pay dirt um, with his legs on this on this situation. Um, but uh, at right here, he's thinking, I can beat KJ. I'm quicker than KJ Wright. 
um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to run. Um, and you know, unfortunately, um, Bobby Wagner is all pro <laughs> linebacker is right there to, uh, to spoil any plan. And, you know, this is two sacks in a row for Allen. The, the Seahawks actually got to Allen seven times in this game. Not that it would ever feel like that during the game that the, this bill's offense gave up seven sacks. A lot of them were just Allen who was holding onto the ball for an extra second in order to try to make a play. And, um, you know, there are a couple of guys you're, you're kind of, you're making a point right here with Cole Beasley, I believe that is, um, and, you know, is he open on this play? Sure. sure. In, the, in, a, but, in a split, right. In the split second that, that he has the opportunity, his eyes are down right now. Yeah. Um, and once his eyes come down, um, he, he sort of stops being a thrower in this situation. And I think we, we both agree that he did have John Brown. Um, and if you're Brian Dable, you probably want Josh Allen to get the ball out of your hands. But the other thing that you maybe want to take into account here too, is with the free rusher, is KJ Wright going to get his arms in the air? Is he going to up in the air? Sure. And, you know, I wonder if Josh didn't see that uh, opening to potentially run, if he throws a pump fake in there to try to get KJ Wright airborne, because it almost looks like he wants to get airborne. Yeah. Um, and, and then maybe you can make a play around him when he gets airborne. But, uh, you know, listen, the situation is the, the Seahawks had a, had a good play call. They executed well. And, uh, and Josh Allen did not take um, the, the hot rate on this play. And that's okay. Um, you know, lived to fight another down. Um, you know, he didn't try to force something um, on the right side of the field or downfield. Yes. He, he knows he's in field goal range and he can't afford to take a big sack on this play. So just, you know, kind of bite the towel, take the hit sure. and, uh, uh, and get three points. They're still in field goal range. And I liked how you started with it. This is not a hero ball play because if this was, this would be Josh running around trying to, you know, pass the ball still when there is basically what appears to be a zero blitz called. So there's not, you know, you're not going through progressions. You're finding your hot route and throwing it, or you're taking the sack here. And, you know, Josh elects to take the sack here. He doesn't elect the third option, which is hero ball. So he protects the ball. He gets wrapped up and, and end up, you know, obviously they get three points off of this uh, drive. All right. Next play is in the second quarter, 640 on the clock, second and 10 situation, another five man rush from the Seahawks and another big throw off a of play action by Josh Allen. You see him hit the top of his drop, find a nice little pocket to throw from, and then he lets it rip from right around, what, the 15, 16-yard line, right inside the 40, right at the 39-yard line. And I like where Josh throws the ball. As that stop route, you know, as that receiver hits the top of the stop route, he doesn't just throw it to where he's standing. He throws it back down towards the line of scrimmage a little more. And again, a big arm throw from Josh Allen. So talk about the timing and the big arm from Josh Allen. Yeah, listen, um, that separation was created by a great route by John Brown, but the maintain uh, him maintaining that separation has everything to do with arm strength. Yep. Um, I mean, you talk about some of the other uh, quarterbacks in the league right now. Um, you're not getting this type of zip on a, on a sideline throw that's 25 yards from the opposite hash. I mean, that's just... It's an impressive arm talent throw um, and really does a good job of putting the ball on John Brown accurately to give him an opportunity to make something um, after the play as well. You know, I, I think in there are examples of years past where a throw like this, um, you know, maybe you lead him into the sideline too far sure. um, where he's got to just t toe tap and walk out of bounds. But he gives John Brown the opportunity to be an athlete, create after the catch. Um, I just it, what this is, is a truly uh, a, a great example of just what pure arm strength can do. Um, and, you know, I, I think, too, based on what the defense is doing here, you look where the safety is up in the middle of the field, like right at the right at the Bills logo. John, yeah. uh, jo Josh Allen is he knows where he's going with this ball almost from the snap. And he doesn't do a whole lot other than to stare exactly at John Brown. But in this sense, it's, it's okay. It's okay. It's man um, coverage. It's man coverage. And you know that safety isn't getting over to help. So I think all in all, um, it was well executed. Great example of Josh Allen's pure arm strength um, and what makes him so hard to defend. Even, even if you're a man corner um, in a good position or you've given up a little bit of separation, there's no closing ability there with that velocity on that ball. All right, first and 10 situation. We're still in the second quarter, and the Bills are in an empty set. And so they get up to the ball very quickly, and the headset's still on. And that matters on this play because you'll see Josh check to a man coverage beater. You see him right there. He's checking. He sees man across the board. He's pointing out the protection, who the mic is for this. And the Bills run uh, a mesh concept over the middle. You're going to see Diggs in the slot to the bottom, Cole Beasley in the slot to the top. And I just love how the defense – with Jamal Adams over the top of Beasley, he is getting help from Bobby Wagner, the rat defender in the middle of the field. So they're paying attention to Cole Beasley, 
while, you know, Stefan Diggs is in the bottom assaulting the leverage of that slot defender. And it opens up for Diggs because of Beasley and the attention that they are paying to him. And it's just an easy play by Josh Allen, but the accuracy matters on this play. There's separation, but uh, as you talked about in the last play, to maintain that separation, this throw has to be on point. It's perfect, right at eye level, and Diggs is able to do something after the catch. And it's something that Bills receivers did really well on the day, Nate. Man, this is just, uh, first and foremost, great check. Um, and, and this is the advantage of having the uh, having the headset on until 10 seconds. Um, because when you get the opportunity to walk up to the line of scrimmage and you're up in the booth, we're seeing the same view that Brian Dable is yeah. um, right now. So this is a huge leg up. And if you're running man coverage against the Bills, first and foremost, God bless your soul. Secondly, yeah. do yourself a favor and, and disguise it. Um, because the last <laughs> thing you want to do is give them 15 seconds on a play clock to check into a play they know they're going to beat you with. Right. Um, and, and this play is a really good example of that. But the patience in the route running that, that Beasley and Diggs show on this play is so impressive. It is just things, these are things, and this is the view. I mean, when you posted this on Twitter, Eric, yeah. my jaw dropped. Watching Diggs on this route, just absolutely flat foot this defender. I mean, puts him on his, on his heels. Um, yeah. I mean, he's damn near squatting when, uh, when Diggs gets back. His stop and start, um, the quickness is just unparalleled, um, for, especially for how compact of a size he is. And then you have the same with, with, um, with Beasley. And the integrity of where these routes need to go, their, their checkpoints on these routes are so important because they're essentially acting as real-time, full-speed pick plays for each other. They're putting that rat defender in a terrible yeah. spot, Bobby Wagner. He can't win. In this nope. situation, and I'm surprised. I mean, based on the on the formation, I could see why you're you're going to face maybe towards that 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 trip side of the field. But man, Stephon Diggs in the slot, and you're giving him outside leverage. I just don't know, you know, from from a technique perspective, from the defense here, and and where their eyes are. Just a confusing, um, poorly coached um, technique on this play. And the bills took advantage of it by throwing an accurate ball here when you're Josh Allen and giving Stefan Diggs, And, and we talked about this and, and that separation that he's, cre- that these wide receivers are able to create. And you can only take advantage of that if you throw the ball accurately. Um, and when you throw the ball accurately, you give them the opportunity to catch and turn up field right away. And you see that here on this play to Stefan Diggs. but I just absolute technician in terms of these routes that we're seeing run. I, yeah fight me on this, but I, I think you're, you're talking about two of the top five route runners in the league yeah. playing on one team, both playing from the slot. Yeah. And Gabriel Davis really gives this team a lot of ability and a lot of flexibility to move Stefan Diggs inside and in those slot plays. I mean, he's damn near starting at, um, he's standing two or three steps outside the tackle. Yeah. Um, that's a huge advantage if you're Stefan Diggs and on that and pre-snap, the defender's going to play outside shade. Like give me that all day. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's just like, this has taken candy from a baby um, executions there, but the play call um, and the route running is just so impressive. Um, if you're Brian Dable, you just got to be licking your lips seeing something like this. Yeah, and I love how you point out Diggs and Beasley in the slot because if you're going to play man coverage, you're going to have to pick your poison. They pick Beasley here, and that leaves Diggs obviously wide open. And, you know, this is dictating coverages. Like, I mean, you're going to put Jamal Adams in man coverage versus Beasley. You got to have leverage help from the linebacker there. So you're committing two guys because Adams can't cover Beasley one-on-one. And as we see later... Adams can't cover Diggs one-on-one either. So having Adams play versus that, you know, two or three receiver inside, it is just not a matchup that they should be having, yet they had it all day, and the Bills took advantage with their shifty, and as you said, top five, maybe top seven route runners in the league. And when you're going to, you're going to try to play man coverage versus those two guys in the middle of the field, you're making the reads a lot easier on Josh Allen, and you're making these plays turn into, you know, five, seven yard gains into big plays, just like Stefan Diggs does here. All right, Nate, second quarter, first and goal. This is the jump pass, or as you said, prior to recording the uh, Tebow pass, the Tebow jump pass. Um, so let me set it up. Uh, Dunmar is the corner just off the screen right here. And this guy, as you saw in the broadcast angle, he was exhausted. And again, I don't know if he was hurt or what, but he was chasing Diggs uh, in a prior couple of plays. He was chasing Brown on a mesh concept. This guy was exhausted. And the Bills and Brian Dable, I don't know if they saw it, but they go right at him. And so 
you're going to see prior to the snap, you're going to see McKenzie come across the formation. Of course, that's the eye candy, but the Bills also have some eye candy and personnel because they have an extra offensive lineman. So they have a few extra offensive linemen here and they have Moss to the right hand side right here. And I mean, as you guys know, the Bills have run a lot of QB draws with Moss in there and they've had success, not just in the red zone, in the open field as well. So the grouping, the eye candy, everything about this play it smells of run. And so on the snap, what Josh is going to do, he's going to fake run. He's going to attack the line of scrimmage. And so it feels like run to the defense. This guy wants to step up with Moss coming as a lead blocker. And the little eye candy, the jet action by McKenzie across the formation gives Gabriel Davis leverage. So he sells the block. And then before Dunbar can even react, it's a touchdown. And I mean, talk about Dunbar on this play and in this game, because he was under attack the entire game. And I mean, he doesn't even look ready on this play. He's still putting his mouthpiece in for God's sakes. I mean, did he think he had to play off Nate? I think he thought he had a great opportunity to take a playoff because it was about <laughs> to be a run. That's what I ultimately I think happened here, but this is just a really good example of layers and right. levels to one particular look. And we know this is, this is a, um, you know, this is one of those routine beaters, right? Because teams think in the red zone, the bills have a routine of what well, we're going to get one yeah. side run. And, and sometimes when it's, and I think last week um, against the Patriots, you know, what I think they did a good job of was spreading five wide and giving Josh the ability to take it up the middle as a QB sneak. But the more opportunities you show that look on film, the more, um, the more defenses are going to try to stop it. So you have to create layers. And this little jump pass is going to live in the nightmares of defensive coordinators watching Josh Allen and trying to find, um, you know, themes to what they're doing in the, in the red zone. And it, once you start to add this pop pass and this element um, to these design quarterback runs, you make it really difficult for defenses to stop you and prepare for what you're going to do in a given look. So I think they did a real nice job of, of breaking tendency here of, right. of creating a level design play um, that really looks like the same play. They run a lot um, with that extra O line. And you mentioned the eye candy of getting McKenzie, another play they like running in the red zone. I mean, yep. right now, if you're, if you're Jamal Adams, right, you're thinking, okay, well, it's either quarterback run, it's jet sweep, or what, right? Like you're not thinking he's going to pull a pop pass because they've never shown that on film. Never. Before. So they did a really nice job of, of, I think, surprising a little bit the defense here. And, you know, I think what uh, Zach Moss does is a great job of pulling that defender away from Gabe Davis, which ultimately uncovers. But this was, this made, this looked easy, but it, you know, I think there's a lot to this play um, because of the, the different posturing the Bills did. Um, in order to get this open. Yeah, there's, I mean, obviously, as you said, layers, this is good scouting. I mean, it, how important is this little fake combo block right here between these two guys so that Bobby Wagner is pulled into the line of scrimmage and out of the passing lane? I mean, that kind of goes unnoticed here as Josh Allen kind of tucks and runs it here and then again pulls up and makes that throw. That is a, a pretty big deal as well. So, so many things going on here inside the five yard line and the Bills capitalize on another real. Really nice design play from Brian Dable. All right, Nate, we're getting towards the end of the first half. Third and sixth situation. This is a big play here. It's a play where Josh Allen hits Cole Beasley, but I do think that Allen dropped his eyes a little bit versus what appeared to be a pressure look. Uh, but, you know, he bails to the top of the screen and makes a play. You see Beasley come across the field and separate, become QB friendly, and Josh, uh, with his incredible arm, does a great job of, you know, making a guy miss an extended play just a little bit longer so he could hit Beasley. But I want you to talk about the context of this play and just, yeah. I mean, it's Allen being a playmaker. It's not the best scramble. He's scrambling basically away from all of his receivers, but I think it, it's just a good play by the playmaker. It's a good play by the playmaker, but the context of the situation is important. It's third yeah. and six, right? Third and six, 56 seconds left on the clock. Uh, Seattle has timeouts and you're at your 30 yard line. You, you throw an incompletion here. You are giving Seattle the ball uh, with an opportunity to score before the end of the half, getting the ball to start the second half. Yep. This was, I mean, for me watching this situation, I, I had anxiety thinking, man, first and foremost, I love that, that Sean McDermott was pressing and decided we're not going to just run the clock out and walk into the half. Um, with a lead. I loved that they remained aggressive. And on this play, it's super important. You get this first down and it ends up being the catalyst um, uh, to getting them down the field even further. But the idea on this play is just extend the play and try to get a first down. Otherwise you're giving the ball back to Seattle with time on the clock 
And it could be a different, we could be talking about a completely different game if Seattle is able to get a three points or a touchdown before the end of the half um, and then get the ball to start the second half. So um, just, just a huge play considering the context of the, of where they were and down a distance and the time of the game. Um, and more importantly for taking some momentum into the second half with you. Yeah. And you know, I'm being harsh on him and, and how he does drop his eyes, but I do think he expects pressure. Uh, he sees these linebackers mugging right here. Um, and I think he expects pressure, but those guys peel off. It's something that the Patriots did to Josh Allen week four last year and then kind of peeled off. They weren't actually blitzing. So I think Josh is actually looking to the hot route to this running back right here in the flats, but that guy gets, pe- gets peeled off. Yeah. yeah by Dunlap. Dunlap. Does, yeah. Dunlap yeah. does a good job on this play of also making it look like he's about to be a free rusher, but then yep. immediately he glues himself to the, to the hot route on, on this play and it's Singletary. But you see, I have Adams totally dropping coverage versus Dawson Knox here as Josh Allen escapes the pocket. So as Josh is looking back across the field, this is a big no, no, you don't want him looking uh-huh. back to the middle. Uh, but what, what that does is it actually pulls Jamal Adams back to the middle of the field instead of out to the boundary. And that opens up Beasley, as you can see right here in behind him. So it's funny how Josh Allen really extended his play with a little juke move right here. His eyes are back to the middle of the field. That gets Jamal Adams, who is obviously a very reactive player, Mm -hmm. to go back to the middle. And then this is where Josh threads it down the field. Josh Allen really put... Jamal Adams almost all game into a just really difficult situation. Yeah. And that's an all pro safety. Say what you will about Jamal Adams, but he's a good player. He's good. Josh Allen, Josh Allen really put him in a, in a, in a blender, a, a whole bunch in this game. Yeah. Just a, another great play outside of structure from Josh Allen. Again, something Pete Carroll talked about after the game, how, you know, Josh Allen, you'll feel his presence. And this is something he does really well. Some with some of the best in the league is extending plays. And he's up against Russ Wilson, who's probably number one when it comes to extending plays and playing outside of structure. Josh Allen might have bested him on this day. All right, Nate, we're in the second half. Now it's a second and 27 situation. This is the pass that Josh hits Gabriel Davis to the top of the screen. And I'm not sure what Dunbar is doing here, but I know what Josh Allen's doing here. He's pulling the string and throwing it with touch up and over Dunbar for a big play, second and 27, and they're getting explosive plays. That was the type of day Josh Allen had here. So I want you to talk about this throw and how, how sneaky good it is for Josh Allen. Well, first of all, it was a touchdown. Sure. Secondly, um, it was. And, yeah, it uh, was. You know, they, they, they showed it. They kind of showed it on a replay. Um, but – I, 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 you have to start to play by trying to understand what, what Quentin Dunbar is thinking on this play. Um, and I think maybe he thinks he's just going right to the sideline, but even so, um, I don't know why you don't turn around. Um, yeah. so I think Josh Allen, um, I, again, I just, I don't know what the corner is doing on this play, but Josh does such a nice job of threading the needle into that hole, um, and delivering a really nice touch pass. Um, and I mean, it's on a string, the, the accuracy of this throw, um, with a defensive tackle barreling down, um, basically uncovered at him. Um, and he's able to throw the football right before he gets there and gets his arm up in the way. Um, it's just, it's just a beautiful throw. It's a beautiful, a beautifully designed play, but great execution from Josh and, uh, and kind of staring down that defender as he approaches him right in the middle of the pocket. All right, Nate, second and eight. We're towards the end of the third quarter, and this is the play where Diggs got matched up versus Jamal Adams in the slot. He comes from across the field there and tries bullying Stefan Diggs at the line of scrimmage, and Diggs is ready for it. He has a plan. He knows that he's going to have to beat press coverage on this play with Jamal Adams. You know, you see him kind of loading up right here to lunge at him. Well, he misses. He avoids that, and then Diggs just goes to work and just separates. Hand up ball on him big play by Stefan Diggs and really that trade for Diggs has been paying off this year for not just Diggs but for Josh Allen as well Nate so from the end zone angle I want you guys to take a look at this because this is really important again five-man pressure but as soon as the ball snapped look at where Josh's eyes are he's looking right at Diggs versus Jamal Adams he sees that Diggs tosses him off the line of scrimmage. So he understands that, yes, there is pressure probably coming, of, you know, in the five-man form. I just need to find somewhere to, to, you know, set my feet and throw. And then as soon as he finds that soft area in the pocket, he reacquires his target and hits Diggs on this play. So, Nate, what are your thoughts uh, about Josh Allen and Diggs on this play and so far this year? Yeah, another thing, too, is – if, if Brian Dable could put defenses into a situation where they're putting their state, their safety over the top of Stefan Diggs in any way, 
you've won pre-snap Win. already. Yep. You've already won pre-snap. Um, so I, I just think it's a great play design and it's great manipulation and confliction when you are moving John, uh, when you're moving Stefan Diggs around and I, you got, anybody can go to next gen stats to see this, but you go to next gen stats and you see the routes that, um, Stefan Diggs runs in a given game. I mean, he's running them from every position. I mean, yes. again, he is, he's essentially two, two spaces off away from the, the left tackle on this play. So yeah. he's starting in a position where again, the defender gives him outside leverage. Um, Jamal Adams wants to get put a little hurt to him, right? He wants to put the the hurting on him, yep. and that's exactly what what Stephon Diggs wants. I mean, you can watch him wait that split second for for Jamal Adams to commit, and that's when he knows he's got him. And for Josh, again, just great job of feeling pressure, knowing where to find the open space in the pocket, create the passing lane necessary to complete this throw um, from start to finish, from route to design. To, uh, to, to the pocket manipulation, to the accuracy of the throw, just a thing of beauty all over the place. But I, I, I just think that any time, um, you know, if you're Brian Dable, that you can um, create a situation where, um, you know, you're getting safeties or linebackers yeah. lined up against Stephon Diggs, like you're, you're winning, man, you're winning. Yeah, and I love, you know, the uh, camaraderie here between Diggs and Adams. Adams is giving him praise here. He's like, yeah, you got me. I love Chad Hall, his excitement. I swear every big play, Chad Hall is down there celebrating with his guys, you know, his receivers. And I love your point about how, you know, Dable is getting the matchup of Adams on on digs here and you know why that is because teams are trying to pressure him the seahawks are sending a five-man pressure and they have a spy on josh allen uh because the running back right here stays in the block so this is dictating coverages this is josh allen and his ability dictating coverages here he's getting digs one-on-one with the safety because they want to play man coverage and pressure and it doesn't work and you know, Eric, like if you're Stefan Diggs, just how happy must you be knowing that you're the focal point of a system and you're the focal point of a passing offense that that genuinely throws the ball to win. And, you know, you go from in in, in Minnesota where he, predominantly he did a lot of his damage from the numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were times where he'd go into the slot, sure, but not the type of movement we're seeing. I mean, they don't have an Adam Thielen. Um, so you don't have a guy that you're going to sit on the outside and and move to the inside more because, uh, you know, you've got the skill set of two really wide receiver ones. I just, for me, and, and another thing that Diggs does here that I think probably sells this the best is, is Diggs moving his head to the right yeah. and keeping his face and his head and his helmet in that direction, that extra split second forces Jamal Adams to to sort of commit to him running a crossing crossing route route. Uh, yeah and so he really sells it really well as a crossing route but there is (laughs) there is levels to him I mean he beat Jamal Adams three times on one route he's so lost Adam is so lost three times on one route oh my god this is why you can't try to you can't press guys that are as quick as Stefan Diggs and you definitely can't do with his safety I mean he just looks absolutely lost on this play and the Bills capitalize it just it's just so funny what Diggs did to the defensive backs of the Seahawks on Sunday. All right, Nate, second and 20. We're in the fourth quarter, top of the fourth quarter. And Josh Allen extends a play again versus pressure, finds a platform, and hits Stefan Diggs in the very same play concept that you just saw. But as you can see, they're, they're not putting Adams on Diggs in the slot again. They're putting a corner in off coverage. So you guys have to understand that based on the technique of the defender, whether it's press coverage versus off coverage, whether it's zone versus man, Stefan Diggs has to have a different plan to attack that, you know, leverage to attack that technique. And you see a different plan here from Diggs. You see him use a little pace. So he's going to throw a little stutter in there, you know, kind of slow down the route stem, use his eyes and then accelerate out wide there. So he beats this off coverage from that defender in a much different way than he did versus press coverage of Jamal Adams on this play. So Josh, again, extends a play it's a a pressure play from the Seahawks Josh finds a platform and hits digs and again these two were on the same page for most of the day on Sunday Nate yeah you're not kidding and uh, I think kudos again should should go to Brian Dable I know I've I've probably (laughs) been beating that drum all day but you know listen it's not necessarily an easy thing to feel like you can go back back to to the well in the same game to plays that work against different looks and credit to, to Brian Dable for understanding um, what his guys are capable of doing against zone um, of, of compared to man coverage. Because we saw this play in a totally separate look from the defense, but it still gets the same result. And I think that's kudos to, A, 
the, the players understanding that you have to have a plan based on the scheme that, that the defense is running. And in this case, Stefan Diggs does such a great job of using the leverage of the defender against him. If you're going to open yourself up um, and give Stefan Diggs the sideline, he's just going to lull you to sleep like he's, t- like he's trying to work across your face. And he just uses his technique right against them. And he does a great job of, of lulling him to sleep um, making him think like he's going to turn it inside and then vertical and yeah. then he stems it off to the sideline. So he does a great job of, it's a three phase route. And, and, you know, I, I said that on, on the previous play that he beat um, Jamal Adams three different times, he doesn't exactly do that here, but you can see the different phases of this route yeah. and just how nuanced it is um, against different looks and the different, um, the different ways you can beat a, a defender given the same route concept. So um, I, I think for me, it's kudos to Brian Dable because Brian Dable does this a lot. If a play works, he doesn't forget about it. He puts it in the he puts it on the front of the stove for for early use and good on him because he uses it pretty soon after he had success with it. Uh, what I mean, yes. on the same drive. Yeah, yeah, and I you know I love that point because we saw the run game develop some big plays uh, against the Patriots in, in the prior week, and they were basically running the same outside zone run yep. with a little fold block, and they were having success, and they just kept going back to it. Uh, and we saw again, this is the pretty much the same play, a different way of attacking it uh, as far as Stefan Diggs goes. And I love your point about how nuanced of a route runner he is. Look at his eyes. He's looking right at that defender. And that defender has inside leverage on, on Diggs, right? So what does Diggs do? Rather than run away from that leverage, no, he attacks it. So he goes right at his inside shoulder. Again, as you said, selling that crossing route. And then he just plants, gets vertical, avoids the hands, and then bounces outside Josh. Good job. I think the offensive line and, and the running back do a good job here of finding uh, their guys to cover up. And then Josh just finds a platform to make this throw. He knows that he has at least two guys rolling out to his side, to the right side of the field. And he's able to find Stefan Diggs for another big play to set up a, a manageable third down. All right, Nate, third and 16 situation. And you got to keep this in mind. The context at the top of the fourth quarter is that the Seahawks are only down seven points at this point. And they send a zero blitz at Josh Allen. Why? I don't know. So Josh recognizes that, you know, prior to the snap and he checks to this screen. And I want you to talk about Josh Allen, not just from the shoulders up on this play, but his accuracy on this, on this pass actually matters. And it's something that we've covered from day one, you know, that it's really wasn't a strength of his, but he, I mean, he hits it on the money. And of course with zero blitz, the bills have advantageous leverage and numbers to get John Brown up the field for nearly a touchdown. Yeah, I got to think if you're if you're Brian Dable and the headset goes off and you watch Josh make this check, you're just you're just standing up and you're waiting for the touchdown to happen. Like you're you're, you're celebrating as the snap uh, and the ball gets to Josh Allen's hands because you know you've just won on the play. And um, I, you know the accuracy point. Listen, this is yeah right exactly. Right? Like he knows <laughs> Chad Hall he knows, knows. <laughs> it's touchdown. Um, but listen, you know this is a third and 14, third and fifteen situation. Situation um, at a pivotal point uh, in this game. If you are forced to punt this ball, um, which by the way, if you don't gain a couple of yards on this play, you're probably going to punt the ball. Um, So, you know, I think kudos to Josh Allen for checking into this play. um, But the accuracy of this ball is super important. And these, as much as they're elementary level throws um, and they're throws that you see all the time being made, especially in the college game, the level of difficulty is, are, are actually, is actually pretty high on these throws, um, especially because Josh makes it off platform. Right. And I have noticed this year more than anything, these screen passes that Josh is throwing off platform, he has found a sweet spot in his mechanics to deliver these balls with velocity, but also catchable because it's really important on these plays that you don't throw the Tyler Croft touchdown play to these guys because you mm-hmm. want them to feel like they can catch the ball and immediately make their way upfield. Um, and that's hard to do when you throw it with too much velocity. You can kind of knock them off their path. So they just do a great job um, uh, on the design of the play. But Josh Allen does a great job um, just getting his throw off platform. But like I said, I, I think you could find several examples of these um, these slip screens that they throw on, on cover zero looks to yeah. John Brown in particular, where he changes the platform and he's found a sweet spot there. Um, where he knows he has confidence he's going to deliver those with accuracy. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because if you go back and look at these checks when he does see zero blitz, 
each of these throws on the wide receiver screens, I don't think they're all the same. I think, uh, as you said, he, he's got the feeling, you know, not the mechanics necessarily being the same every throw. He just has a feeling on how he has to let it rip and what it feels like. And I think that's something that he's developed as he's gotten in the league, because it's not something that he did well at Wyoming. They kind of avoided it. And I mean, you saw as soon as he checked to that, he had a good idea that it was probably going to be a touchdown. Of course it wasn't. I think if John Brown's healthy and Bacher doesn't touch him here, I do think that maybe this is a touchdown, but either way, this is a great way to, to, you know, conclude this breakdown because it shows Josh Allen winning, not with his arm, which we saw, we saw big time throws. We, we saw him extend plays. We saw him extend plays from in the pocket, outside the pocket, but this time he does it from the shoulders up and it really sealed the game for the bills. This after they get this big play here, um, the bills offense was confident. They could close it out. All right, Nate, that was a fun breakdown. I want to talk about, you know, this game and maybe big picture going forward. So let's start with, Obviously, the pass happy first half and pass happy game from Brian Dable, Josh Allen, the Bills offense. And it was a complete opposite the prior week. It was a heavy run game for the Bills. Well, by Bill standards now, mm -hmm. their spread offense now. Um, so let's talk about, you know, maybe what we can expect uh, going forward. Yeah, I'll tell you two guys I'm really, uh, uh, I'm definitely nervous about. Buda Baker um, is one of those really good young safeties. Yeah. Um, uh, and I don't think you're going to get to see too many times of him one-on-one uh, -on -one with Stefan Diggs. Uh, but if you do, um, he's going to, he's significantly better in coverage areas than Jamal Adams is. So that'll be a better matchup this week. But to your point, it's a lot like the Texas Tech defense that we saw Cliff Kingsbury um, run in college. So yeah, yeah, a lot of college concepts defensively. Listen, this is a two, this is a two, uh, two horse race on the defense between the two defensive backs that they've got in Buda Baker um, and, uh, and Pat Pad, Patrick Peterson, um, obviously one of the, 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 one of the best and, and maybe longest standing corners in football right now, just consistency year in and year out um you know i'm really looking forward to seeing that that matchup between Diggs and peterson um but you should the 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 i think their key horse uh, and maybe the most important catalyst for that defense's success um chandler jones not in the lineup i think the bills yeah. are gonna have some opportunities we know uh we know the best ways that you can attack a guy like jordan uh jordan phillips who is going to be motivated to play in this football game so there's yeah. a lot of storylines um offense versus defense in this game but i think ultimately um you know the the arizona cardinals got eaten up the week prior um, by the Seattle Seahawks yeah. offense, um, they scored um, uh, at least offensively Arizona. We know that they put up 30 points last week against uh, in that loss against the Dolphins and then 37 in that win against the Seahawks. So this should be another offensive duel. I'm really looking forward um, to seeing Josh Allen, um, you know, follow up the performance um, and hopefully see a nice pass heavy offense, too. Although I don't think this week um, the defensive coordinator, um, which I believe is Vance Joseph. Mm -hmm. um, for the um, for the Arizona Cardinals, will be as surprised as Pete Carroll was to see the Bills throw the ball so much. Yeah, and that was you know a funny clip of Carroll saying that, but I I, I do think it has to do with as I mentioned a couple of times how run heavy they were the prior week, and I think when you're game planning against a team like the Bills and you saw them have success against you know a team that plays a lot of man coverage in the Patriots, and you saw them just you know decide to run the ball. I think you you come into a game plan or you start your curating your game plan with a certain amount of pass coverages. And I think, I think Carol ran out because the bills ran so many. And, and so they started, they just started throwing stuff against the wall yeah. to see if that might work. Cause nothing else was, which sounds crazy, but you guys got to remember there are only, only so many plays that offensive and defensive coordinators come into a game with. And when yeah. you have a team come out and what was the ratio in the first half and run the pass? It, three. Yeah. That's nuts. Like, okay. You pretty much run all of your defensive coverages by that point. And yep. so uh, you've seen everything, which again, maybe this is what Dable wanted to do. Okay. They showed all of their hands, all of their cards are on the table. As far as coverages go, well, we're having success against it. Let's continue with it. And that's why mm -hmm. you saw a lot of the same pass concepts. Uh, and you saw us break down a few of them. So I think that was an interesting approach. And from what I remember, one of the players of the bill is saying, they said that it was supposed to be more balanced but they were having so much success. And again, the ratio got kind of out of hand, but in a good way. And so they just exploited it. And why wouldn't they with the, yeah. the coverages that the and Hawks you know, are running? Um, Eric Wood does his weekly uh, spot on WGR with, uh, with Mike Schoff and the Bulldog. And Mike actually asked him a really great question about, you know, how, when, when you pass that much, uh, 
how do you, as an offensive lineman, like, do you like that? I mean, typically what we know about offensive linemen is they like run blocking. It gives them the opportunity yeah. to get the upper hand on the defender. They're moving forward. They're not getting beat up as much. But Eric Wood kind of mentioned this and, and, and answered it perfectly. You know, when your game script maybe calls for your first 12 plays to be passing plays and your first five red zone plays to be pass plays and your first, you know, like, and you start to realize that you're going to be a pass, ha- uh, pass happy um, game plan. You know, maybe that's a little concerning to an offensive lineman who thinks, man, they're going to just be they're going to get beaten up all day. They're going to have pass rushers, you know, teeing off. Yeah. But if you're having that type of success early on as offensive lineman, I think you just want to You want to ride the lightning. You want to ride the storm. And I think um, in that game, um, I think it's a great example of not sticking to a script um, and, and letting success breed more success. And um, again, I, I'll say it for like the 15th time on this podcast, but <laughs> kudos to Brian Dable because he continues putting together game plans um, that he doesn't pigeonhole. He doesn't corner himself into, into not preparing for right. everything that a defense can throw. And, and I think his preparation, the, the, um, uh, the communication and how much Josh Allen and Dable are on the same page, how much they enjoy working together. Um, they, they, they say it every day and I, I believe them. Um, yeah. I genuinely think there's, there, there's a level of friendship um, and kinship between the two that they just enjoy working together and playing together. And it shows, um, and, and listen, football's fun. It's a game. Um, and you know, I think sometimes NFL teams can lose that a little and, and yeah. lose the fun aspect of it. That game was fun. The game plan was fun. The execution was fun. And I think that really, when you're having fun like that, it rubs off on the rest of the roster. And I don't want to underplay the fun that the offense was having on the step we've seen from the defense. I think a lot of yeah. what the offense was doing in that game rubbed off on what the defense was doing and gave them the confidence they needed to shut down that Seattle Seahawks offense. And the special teams. All three phases oh, yeah. were, were clicking, and I'm glad you mentioned the relationship between Dable and Allen, and uh, we saw that in the press conferences this week after the tragedy with, uh, obviously, you know Josh Allen's grandmother passing. But um, I just think you're starting to see more development, not just in the game plans, but also the in-game adjustments. And I think that communication has grown. I think the staff is, you know, kind of hitting their stride. And, you know, it's not perfect. It hasn't been perfect week to week. But the in-game adjustments, especially in this game, once those guys were starting to heat up Josh Allen, throwing those screens out, little things like that, um, you know, giving Josh Allen the answers to the plays, uh, uh, you know, those checks to, to screens and whatnot. I think all that's starting to come together. And they're starting to make a run. They're starting to win in different ways. And week to week, the Cardinals, I mean, what – offense are they going to see this week you don't really know right. how the bills offense is going to attack you and beat you so it's, the it's fun weeks, the last two weeks did a lot for the bills in terms of showing their hand to, mm-hmm. to teams going from a run heavy look one week to a really pass heavy look um you and i have talked about balance right talking yeah. about at the end of the year that's when i care about balance from a game in and game out i don't need it to be 50 50 I think eventually by the end of the year, you're going to see this team really close to like 60, 40, somewhere in that neighborhood where it's right where they should be. And I think that is the new, that's, that's modern day 2020 NFL balance is 60, 40. And I think by the end of the year, they'll be there. And that's all that matters is there's going to be games where Brian Dable knows that they're going to have to run the ball to win. Last week, they knew they had to pass the ball to win. And there's going to be games where they do a little bit of both. Yep. Um, and the good news is, is they've proven two weeks in a row now that they can be efficient doing both. No doubt about it, man. So what do you got going on this week with WGR and uh, what can we expect from you? Yeah, I filled in uh, earlier in the week for Howard. I got the rest of the week off, though. Um, so I'll be back on Saturday for Sports Talk Saturday, my normal 11 to 2 slots. You can catch me there. Um, and then pregame, uh, late start this week. So uh, I'll be watching a little Masters Golf. Uh, there you but go. Also preparing uh, for that Bills Arizona game, 405 start. So looking forward to it. Awesome. And you guys will see us again in the film room next week. So thanks for joining us this week. I am Eric Turner. That's Nate Gary from WGR. We'll see you next week.